afternoon and good evening, depending on the time zone that you're in. Uh, my name is Nathan Gao, and I'm doing a presentation for the SCOMathon 2021 on securing your SCOM environments, focusing on mitigating attacks specifically designed to your SCOM environment. For the agenda of our demonstrations, our presentation today, uh, obviously we'll have a, an introduction. I'm going to cover the Microsoft tier model and credential theft, some really basics on that. Uh, I'm going to talk about SCOM's role in the tier model and some design principles that we can, uh, or some design principles that we can use to mitigate risks associated with credential theft and SCOM in particular. <coughs> Uh, as always, this uh, conversation will have a Slack channel going on, and uh, and as well, feel free to join on at this at any time. I know I will be on the Slack channel periodically throughout uh, the conference, uh, as will many of the other speakers and whatnot. So um, use that as a great opportunity to network, uh, talk to speakers uh, such as myself, uh, ask vendors, so on and so forth. Uh, other key links, obviously, if you don't have a uh, mic, uh, we can we can get this uh, directly on the Slack um, uh, on the Slack uh, login uh, as well. We've got Scom Cafe and then the Scomathon for uh, the links as well. Uh, additional links, I'm sorry, I, I can't really read that, but <laughs> um, but uh, for those uh, looking at this in other languages, additional links that you, you have available to you. All right, just to introduce myself, uh, I've been working in technology for 20 plus years now. I started in 1999 in, uh, uh, for a small uh, technical training facility. And I've worked in uh, small, medium, and large scale enterprises. Uh, I've gone across multiple industry verticals, such as the US government, pharmaceutical, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and whatnot. I'm fairly known, uh, fairly well known within the SCOM community for developing the SCOM Security Monitoring Management Pack, which I have been working on now for, I was just doing the math on this the other day, but it seems I've been doing this for about five years now. Um, and you can find all of my work on my blog at uh, nathangow.wordpress.com. As well, for those who are listening in, feel free at any time to reach out to me at LinkedIn. You'll see my LinkedIn profile linked on the blog. Um, Feel free to, to connect with me on LinkedIn. I do try to answer questions uh, uh, when time permits, and uh, would be more than uh, I would would look forward to meeting you. So. Okay, content links. So uh, these are actual links to uh, various uh, um, various uh, uh, various things that I'm going to be referencing throughout it. So so the uh, the top one and the the third one are actually blog articles that I've written. Uh, and the second one is, or actually I should say a series of blog articles that I have written. Uh, and I linked off to the first part of the series uh, in each of them, but, but each of those series is, has uh, links to the additional pieces. So uh, and then, of course, the middle is our cybersecurity reference architecture that uh, uh, Microsoft publishes. Uh, not for the faint of heart, that's a really, really, really busy slide if, uh, if you wanted to look at it. But uh, I kind of get a good idea as to security and how that's... Um, uh, uh, just gets you a good idea of just how complex a security uh, uh, environment is. All right, so the first thing we want to talk about here is the tier model and credential theft. So I, I wrote a piece uh, actually last summer, um, Cybersecurity for the IT Professional. do highly recommend that as a read. Uh, it is actually geared more for the IT professional and not for the cyber community. And it kind of boils down a lot of those cyber concepts that uh, I think we run into issues with uh, throughout our environment. I, I find that in most uh, most environments, people are very interested in security. Uh, the field itself, though, is incredibly vast, and there's a lot of, I don't want to say misinformation is not the right term, but there's a lot of information out there that uh, um, it's like, oh, you got to protect against this, and you got to protect against that. And uh, oftentimes, it, it misses the mark. So um, I, I wanted to really talk a little bit about the tier model and this, this whole concept of, uh, of identifying against identity. Because uh, the reality when it comes to the modern playbook that attackers use is that most attackers have a pretty well spelled out playbook that uh, effectively does the same things. They've got it commoditized so that they can do it over and over and over and over again. And, and most of our cyber solutions just miss that basic concept. Um, 
So if you're curious about the standard playbook that an attacker uses, it's, you know, I'm going to go ahead and fish a random user, or I can fish the IT person or something like that. So I send that targeted email, or maybe it's just a broad email, but eventually I'm going to get somebody to click on a link that they shouldn't click on. Uh, and when that happens, uh, you know, you install their malware on your computer or that person's uh, computer will get their malware and uh, effectively that attacker is going to get themselves a, a small beachhead into the environment. Uh, from there, they're going to go through a process called collecting credentials. Uh, where they're going to take a look at what's on the computer, who's signed on to this computer, and when other people sign on to the computer, they collect their credentials too. And there's all sorts of means to, to collect credentials. Uh, so probably the more common one that you've heard of is pass the hash, um, where I'm uh, grabbing the user hash out of the LSA. But tools like key loggers um, or, or some modern attack tools can pull hashes of local admin accounts and so on and so forth. Uh, the point being is they've, they've got all sorts of methods to, to, to collect credentials. Okay, So once they have credentials, they start reusing them, and they start moving from PC to PC to PC uh, silently in the background. You can't see it. They're just logging onto your system, and they're collecting more credentials. Until effectively, eventually, they're, they're going to find themselves the, uh, a machine that says, say, has me, the help desk admin, or me, the server admin, or me, the domain admin, or whatever it is, and I'm signed on to the machine. What I don't know is they're also signed on to as soon as I answer my credentials from my DA accounts, BSA and RDP or something like that, uh, they now have access to that credentials, and now they can go ahead and, and sign on to the domain controller as me, um, and then go do whatever it is that they were intending on doing. So uh, Microsoft has is, is kind of started pushing this concept of a tier model, and what we're trying to do is to separate administrative layers um, to protect organizations' most critical access, uh, assets. And mixing cr administrative credentials across these tiers is the vulnerability that uh, is generally exploited. It's basically what I just described in that, that uh, story on credential theft. So this is the tier model in, a, in kind of a nutshell, okay? So um, uh, at, your, at your top level, and this is right out of some of the slides that, that, that we use, if, if you were to bring me in as a cyber professional to, 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 to do some basic workshops for you, uh, right out of the slide decks that we would use. But at that top level tier is really what manages authentication and identity. Um, so all of your domain controllers are by default in tier zero. Um, uh, other tier zero service, such as your certificate infrastructure falls under tier zero. Exchange, if you're running it on-prem, does just because of the nature of the way the org admin and domain admins work. Uh, Exchange is effectively a tier zero asset, even though in my opinion it shouldn't be. Uh, just because of, uh, of the power that Exchange account has, it's effectively a tier zero. Um, uh, I, I would add uh, on tier zero, you know, so Really, anything that's running with a domain admin level access, right? If I've got a service account running with domain, ad, domain admin level access, that's a tier zero system, uh, and it should be protected accordingly. Um, and as we're going to kind of get into how SCOM works, anything that has an agent that sits on a domain controller or a tier zero system is also effectively a tier zero system. Because at the end of the day, if I own that management server, or whatever that is, um, I can I can use it to do things um, on that tier zero server. Um, at the tier one layer, that's more of our data layer. So think of that along the lines of um, your your SQL servers, uh, your SharePoint, um, you know, custom line of business app A through through Z, um, and whatnot. Tier one is typically what the attackers are after. So this is where it gets kind of fun, right? Tier zero is keys to the kingdom. Tier one is everything that the attacker typically wants. Um, you think about it for a second. You know, if I'm going to do some sort of uh, crypto uh, uh, crypto ransomware, right? I want to encrypt something and, and force you to, to, to pay me a ransom in order to get back my environment. Um, you know, if I, if I get the, the, the data servers that holds your, your secret recipes or your critical line of business things, right, I, I've downed your business until you pay up or restore from backup or whatever that may be, um, and, and whatnot. Um, so, uh, or if I'm just trying to steal your secrets, that's typically not going to be located in the tier zero that, uh, that's going to be in tier one. You may have certain, uh, tier one systems higher protected because of the secrets that are on them, uh, but that's effectively tier one. Um, now, obviously, the danger within Tier 1 is similar. If I stick an agent on a Tier 1 system to, for, for management of a Tier 1 system, and then, then effectively, whatever that system is, it's, it's now Tier 1 because of, because of that concept. Um, likewise, uh, um, 
uh, you know, your major tier one accounts, let's just call it the, the, the Joe server admin account that is an administrator on all the servers in the domain. Even though that's not technically a domain admin account, it's, it's very, very, very close in terms of priority. So there's a little bit more complexities involved in securing tier one and SCOM for all intents and purposes, if we design it right, is ideally a tier one application. Um, and so we're going to, for this presentation, being focused more only, mainly on tier one and tier zero. Um, tier two is our end user uh, environment. So that's just uh, all of your, as I call it, productivity machines, okay? Um, now, the moral of the story when you're looking at tiers is you want to event writing up or writing down from tiers because when that happens, you have the potential for credentials to mix. And anytime you have two sets of credentials running on the same piece of physical uh, or on the same physical or virtual machine, you have a real problem uh, with potential credential theft. So just to use this as an example, I'm on my productivity machine, which is a tier two machine. I RDP to a domain controller from my productivity machine. At the time I RDP to that system, um, my username and password for my DA account coexists on the same machine that I uh, did my RDP from, my, 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 my desktop machine. So if the bad guy happens to have access to my desktop machine, which is very easy for them to access in most environments, right? Uh, either via pass a hash or a key logger or some other method, they can swipe that domain admin credentials and now they effectively have my account, uh, which they can turn around and sign on to um, domain controller as me. So there are no brute force attempts, no account lockouts, those types of things that come into play in that scenario. So as far as you, the end user, are aware, you're just completely oblivious to what they're doing because they're, 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 they're acting as if they are you. Um, I think the moral of that story, if I were to explain this, is attackers don't typically break in these days. They just log in. Um, they, they're not going to brute force your account guess your password and do all that fun stuff. They are literally going to figure out a way to grab your password or your hash and sign on as you. This is their tried and truth method. So the moral of the story when looking at the tier models is we don't want to cross tiers anytime, at any time. Um, so that kind of gets me to the ne next slide. Uh, credential theft occurs at the machine layer. Uh, attackers do not care if the machine is physical or, uh, physical or virtual. Uh, any system where both administrative and non-administrative credentials are used uh, are, is at risk. And once they have a beachhead in your environment, they're going to target management tools such as SCOM or SCCM. Um, I've uh, not personally done a whole lot of, uh, of uh, compromise recovery uh, in my six plus years at Microsoft. Uh, but I, I have had the ability to do a couple. And what I could say is, is in, in each of the cases that I've been, it's been a management tool that was compromised. Um, because ultimately management tools, tools typically have a much more valuable account. And so that's one of the first things they're gonna look for when they're trying to, uh, when they're trying to infiltrate your environment and get your stuff. So my conclusion is designed to mitigate vulnerabilities. So again, if you uh, pull up the uh, uh, cybersecurity for the IT professional uh, series that I wrote, I, I kind of dive into this in a lot more detail. I uh, highly recommend the read. So I wanted to kind of get this out of the way. Um, I, I think next time around, we may go into this in a little bit more detail. And I talked to Bruce about covering this in a, in a later presentation uh, and whatnot, because there's a lot of interest behind this. Um, but uh, the important thing is, is we got to think about mitigating those types of vulnerabilities, because this is what the attackers are doing right now in your environment. So. On to SCOM, and the reason why we're here, because we all like this product called SCOM. Um, so obviously it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, something I mentioned, or I didn't even realize actually until it was somebody from, uh, uh, was either squared up or cooked down, I don't remember who, um, just sent me an article on it. I can actually deploy software via SCOM. Um, the libraries are there uh, for an author that knows what they want to do. Um, SCOM's agents, just to put this in perspective, runs uh, effectively as the local system administrator or a local system accounts, right, on any machine that it manages, effectively making it an administrator. I can execute scripts, PowerShell, you know, all sorts of things under that context. So uh, the ability to say import a malicious manager or a malicious management pack, just to use that as an example, could be used to compromise your environment in a hurry. If I were to compromise your SCOM environment, 
Next thing I do, I drop in a man management pack that deploys all my malware, and now I own all of your environment. Um, uh, as well, the service accounts that SCOM runs under in most environments uh, typically have very high privilege. Um, I know when I first started doing SCOM, it was a mistake I consistently made was uh, saying, hey, you know, that action account really needs to be a local admin and only your machines. That way you can push patches and those types of things. Um, because, you know, a lot of things run under that management server action account context. Uh, and ultimately, when you think about it, that's that's really, really bad practice because that account, uh, as soon as it logs onto a machine, those credentials are now stored in memory and uh, um, so on and so forth. Bad guys sitting on one machine, they get access to that account and they now own the account, right? Um, so uh, it's rolling the tier model. It's kind of big. Um, it also typically in environments or in uh, in most environments that I've worked in, I will typically see SCOM managing both Tier 0 and Tier 1 assets from the same management group. So what that means is, is I've got basically a, me, I'm the SCOM admin, but I am managing domain controllers with SCOM because we want alerts off of our domain controllers to um, you know make sure they're running healthily. Totally understandable. Uh, the problem is, is that if my SCOM admin account is compromised, I've basically given the bad guys access to my tier zero environment because they own SCOM. Uh, so they can they can get to my domain controllers through SCOM uh, and whatnot. <clears throat> okay, so other things, SCOM holds run as accounts. I think that kind of goes without saying, but run as accounts have different layers of, of uh, uh, privileges. You have to distribute run as accounts with SCOM. If you improperly distribute them, uh, you run the risk again of exposing credentials onto systems that they should not be exposed on. SCOM uses an agent. We talked about that already, right? It runs uh, effectively as an administrator on domain controllers, um, and what and whatnot. Um, in most environments, a, a single SCOM instance manages both tier one and tier zero systems. Uh, every now and then, you'll see tier uh, uh, tier two come into play as well. Uh, if you've got a workstation or a kiosk or something like that that's managed in SCOM, um, but it, it it can uh, can potentially uh, can potentially be in your environments. Although typically, we don't see that that much. Um, and as I mentioned, we can execute scripts, install software, disable enable services, uh, cover tracks. I mean, I can do all sorts of things with SCOM, right? I can I can write recovery items to to delete log files if I wanted to. Um, or tasks to delete log files. Um, you know, I, I can establish persistence mechanisms via SCOM, right? Because uh, I can just tur turn around and rerun that script that, uh, that I had access in the first place. And so as soon as you drop the SCOM agent on there because you haven't cleaned up SCOM, I, I've reestablished persistence in the environment. Um, <clears throat> so the point being is a SCOM is a very, very powerful tool, and we need to actually think very, very hard about how we're going to design our SCOM environments uh, to protect against credential theft uh, and, and, and various types of credential theft that an attacker may employ. So my conclusion, my general opinion in most environments that I have walked in and looked at personally, if an attacker owns SCOM, they own you, which gets us to our design principles. Excuse me. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to talk about securing run as accounts. We're going to talk about securing administration, and we're going to talk about separating tiers. So um, I did write a white paper several years ago now, and that was one of the ones um, listed in the uh, in, in the intro slide to this. Um, on securing SCOM and some of the various things you might want to think about when you're deploying a SCOM environment and trying to do so in as secure manner as possible. Uh, so I, that's another one I highly recommend to read. Um, I'll, I'll give you the, the Cliff's notes. In an ideal world, you want separate management group instances for both Tier 0 and Tier 1, and if you're doing it, Tier 2. Um, I know that realistically, that's probably something that people are going to balk at because now I've just uh, increased the administrative um, uh, I've increased the administrator increased the administrative headache behind it for now my domain controllers are come out of one scom environment and you know my tier one environment is, is being managed in another uh, if you've engaged with Microsoft in the past you're probably familiar with uh, um, 
Uh, you're probably familiar with some of our ESAE and our Ed Forest engagements, those types of things. That's that's exactly what we did. We actually built a, a SCOM environment for securing uh, um, uh, securing Tier Zero and and Tier One, and they were separate environments. Um, so if you're really, really, really serious about it and you don't mind the ex extra administrative headache, that's probably the route you can go. Realistically speaking, though, I know in a lot of environments, that might not be the right answer. And so at that point, we need to start thinking about what we can do to at least mitigate against those risks. Um, so, all right. Um, securing RANAS accounts. So uh, SCOM 2012 through 2016, RANAS accounts must log on locally to a system. <clears throat> uh, and then SCOM 2019 requires RANAS accounts to log on as a service. Now, I put this in red just so that people understand. Yes, the 2019 option is a little bit more secure, um, but anything that's still running on a system is still potentially available to exposure. So uh, the issue with Rana's accounts is, one, you need to know what the account's permission is. I mean, it kind of goes without saying, but I probably shouldn't be using high value accounts for Rana's accounts. They should be least privileged scoped to just what is needed on the machine. So, you know, I may have a run as account for say SharePoint, for instance. Okay, if that account is an administrator over just SharePoint and doesn't have the rights to log on anywhere else, uh, and I'm distributing it to my SharePoint server, the risk is very, very, very low of that account being able to be used something because I've properly secured that account. If said SharePoint account, just, just as an example, happens to also be a domain administrator, um, now I've upped my risk considerably. And uh, uh, I, I've upped that risk considerably. And uh, because it, it's a DA account, if somebody gets my SharePoint server, um, then they now own a DA account. Um, if I'm distributing it liberally, I've also increased that, right? Because that DA account is now running on multiple machines. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, uh, never use a less secure run as account distribution. For those of you who are SCOM, uh, SCOM experts who've been doing this for a while, you know what I'm talking about. Right click on the run as accounts and you go to the distribution tab. There's an option for less secure run as uh, distribution. What happens when you do that, for the record, and I, I did write an article on this and, and exposed just how easy credential theft was in the scenario. Uh, I, I wrote that uh, years ago, but I do link it in the uh, Securing SCOM piece. But uh, what happens is, is that account's credentials are now running in memory on every single server in the environment, hence less secure, which means I just need to compromise one system with a SCOM agent, and I have the uh, potential of, of mining that account. Um, so uh, the next one obviously goes fairly straightforward as well. I, we're, we want to use least privileges for SCOM run as account distribution as well. Uh, you know, whatever I'm going to distribute in SCOM really should only have rights to the machines I'm distributing it for. Uh, it, it should not be one of those accounts that, oh, this is just a server admin everywhere, right? Uh, I want to do some sort of run as account distribution for, say, a SQL server. And for some reason, I don't want to use Kevin's uh, uh, low privilege solution that uh, uh, that works off of the NT services. Um, then, uh, I, you know, I need to make sure that account only has rights to the SQL Server or the SQL servers that, that it's supposed to monitor. Uh, and keep in mind that the greater number of servers, the more risk of exposure. So I think even your SQL admins will tell you that I, I shouldn't have a, a very many of those global SA accounts that are floating around. And I wouldn't want to use something like that for distribution either. Um, as well, I would frequently audit this because this is something I've observed in environments. Uh, we, we, we set things up the way it should be set. And then you come back a month later and you're visiting the customer and you look at it and it's been changed. Um, now, somebody was probably doing it to troubleshoot it or they didn't know what they were doing. Um, and, and, and that's fine. And by the way, with SCOM 2019, we actually have audit capabilities built into SCOM so we can start tracking some of this stuff too, which is kind of nice. Uh, but uh, at least with UR2 and UR3 for the record. Um, but the point being is, is that we really want to keep an eye on that Rana's account distribution and make sure that Rana's accounts have not been distrib uh, distributed in a way that is harmful to the environment. All right, securing administration. <clears throat> so uh, administration of SCOM is uh, another dangerous piece. It's something that attackers can um, 
uh, take advantage of. So keep in mind, again, the SCOM agents are effectively administrators in the machine they monitor. I've mentioned that a couple of times, which means that the administrators can do whatever they want uh, in your environment. <clears throat> um, so it, depending on how you've set up privileges, right, SCOM users can still execute tasks. And this really is based on the management pack design and uh, kind of waffle back and forth when you think about it. So for instance, uh, use an example, a SQL management pack, I can take a database offline task. It's available inside of the SQL management pack, or at least it was at one point. So I decide to delegate that, uh, that view to my help desk operators. Uh, I have unknowingly given help desk operators the ability to take a, a SQL database offline. Now, uh, reality is that probably never happens um, because you know, very rarely do I see people running tasks out of SCOM. And typically when they're being done, it's people that actually know what they're doing. Um, but you know, you, you don't want to run into a situation where somebody who shouldn't have rights over your environment does. So you got to keep in mind anything that you delegate to a regular user, uh, they make sure that the tasks available to, to them are what you're comfortable running. Otherwise, you're going to need to do a little bit more scoped delegation roles when you're when you're building uh, their environment. Um, keep in mind, you can do that with RBAC when you create a custom role in SCOM, right? You can you can limit the tasks that somebody has available to them uh, and, and those types of things. Um, but you need to understand that because SCOM agents is effectively a systems admin, um, you know, a SCOM administrator or even a SCOM user, right, uh, has the ability to do things that are, say, beyond their level of uh, that the organization has given them. If the SCOM environment is compromised, uh, you've uh, basically given the attacker the key, uh, likely given the attacker, I should say, the keys to the kingdom. So uh, design principles around securing administration. This is something we've been preaching at Microsoft for a while, right? But the all SCOM administration should go through a dedicated uh, administrative workstation. Now, I did link that off to uh, our online documentation of dedicated workstations. Um, but the moral behind this concept, or the moral of the story, I should say, is that what a dedicated administrative workstation does is it's separating the administrative and non-administrative credentials at the physical layer. Um, as soon as my admin and non-admin credentials, if they're being run at all ever from the same machine, right? Somebody sitting on that machine can swipe them. So typically we're gonna recommend that the, any kind of administrator really, we start with tier zero and kind of work it into tier one, but any kind of administrator step two, uh, workstations that are working off of. Um, one for dedicated administrative use and one for productivity use, like Outlook, and, and internet searching, and, and those kinds of things. Um, obviously, the dedicated administrative machines should be locked down and hardened. Um, so, you know, you're know you not going to be able, you know, firewalls are enabled, it's blocking all inbound ports, so people can't kind of sniff them out and see where they're listening at. And, and uh, just jump on and sign on to them like they would anything else, right? It's a physical machine. You can even disable uh, you know, RDP inbound on something like that, right? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a physical machine. Um, but the idea behind it is, is that my administration is going to happen from one machine and one machine only, and it's a hardened machine. And my non-administrative work uh, will stay in tier two. So what happens then when the attacker compromises tier two is, is they can go ahead and they can own whatever they want within tier two if they're able to move around. And obviously there are ways to slow them down there too, but we're not really focused on that. Um, but they're not going to find any administrative credentials because uh, we're administrating them from dedicated machines that we're treating uh, as tier one and tier zero, right? So if I have a tier zero administrative workstation, it's it's going to be treated as though it's a tier zero asset. I can only sign on to that with, with User, users who are domain admins are the only ones who get them. Um, you know, again, the machines, you, you cannot already, I mean, we, we put all sorts of security mechanisms on them uh, to prevent people for, or prevent anyone from already peeing into them, for connecting to them remotely. They're, they're not allowed because it's dedicated to the administrator and stays with the administrator. Uh, same concept within tier one. If I'm going to do administration from SCOM, uh, I really should be doing that from a separate machine. Um, there are, for the record, known vulnerabilities, uh, or at least been demonstrated, I don't know if there's actual attacks out there in the wild that do this, um, that are designed to fish a SCOM administrator, 
get them to click on that crazy cats video or whatever it is. And um, uh, immediately we'll take advantage of the SCOM APIs that are installed and, and use it to import their stuff into your SCOM environment. It's all automated, very easy to do. All you need to do is click on the wrong link. And, and in case of that particular vulnerability, I do think you need administrative rights on your machine. But uh, even if you don't, if you give them inroads to your machine, they can eventually get admin rights and do what they want to do. It just slows them down. Um, the point being is, is if we start separating the administrative and the non-administrative machine, they can fish me all day long. It doesn't matter because I'm not using those credentials on that machine. Um, <clears throat> Uh, your paws, by the way, are not supposed to have administrative access. You do not install productivity applications on them, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> also, within design principles, we want to secure our BSC for SCOM administrators and remaining IT staff. And it really is just a matter of going through, you know, what am I going to give people rights to? I think in most environments, we just say, oh, you're a SCOM admin, so you're an IT person. I'm sorry. We're just going to make you a SCOM admin. It's not that I don't trust the other IT people in the environment, but the reality is, is your SCOM administrators should probably be your, your only SCOM admins, those that are actually designing and maintaining SCOM. Uh, and your Active Directory administrators probably shouldn't be, um, nor do they want to be either, I might add. So uh, uh, keep that one in mind. Um, but uh, in the same token, we need to start looking at who else is using it, right? If I've got a help desk or uh, some sort of uh, network operations center, uh, where they're using SCOM as one of the one or their only tool, right? Uh, we need to make sure that the tasks that they have available to them are ones that we're comfortable with them running. And, and that does require uh, a little bit of work on your part because at the end of the day, you're going to have to review each and every management pack because each and every management pack has tasks and those kinds of things. And if you don't want somebody running them, then you probably, uh, you're going to need to set up some sort of, uh, sort of role-based access control to prevent them from doing it. <clears throat> All right, separating tiers. Um, so I've kind of already touched on this, right? But I'm just gonna, uh, just for, for um, uh, emphasis purpose, uh, reiterate it here. But again, the presence of any agent uh, in any tier uh, effectively makes SCOM and administrative, have administrative control over that tier. Um, <clears throat> so that allows them, they can do one of two things. They can acquire additional resources within the tier, or they can actually acquire all of the resources within the tier. Um, so, uh, you know, once I get that SCOM environment, I now own, even if you're, you know, if you're, if you're separating out and you have a different management groups, I, I get a hold of that, right? I now own tier one. Uh, I get a hold of tier zero SCOM. I now own tier zero. Um, I have heard of organizations are actually one example of an organization that wanted to actually use a, uh, agent action accounts and then lease, uh, and then reduce its privileges. But that becomes a bit of an administrative headache to, to put it bluntly. Um, so I'm not sure I would necessarily go down that road, um, just because of the, uh, the administrative overhead. Uh, but if I'm really, 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 really concerned about it, then perhaps I separate my, uh, uh, you know, set up a separate management group for, for tier one and, and, uh, and then one for tier zero. Um, if that layer is still too complex, then, then maybe we should go back to this previous slide, right? And start talking about um, dedicated administrative workstations, securing our runners accounts and doing some of those things to really knock out all of the things that attackers are very interested in their playbook and making sure that we're auditing ourselves and that we're not giving them a So, in an ideal world, back to separating tiers, uh, you know, in an ideal world, uh, we want to separate tier zero and tier one systems. Um, and if we can't do that, right, you really should be treating SCOM as a tier zero system, okay? So, think of it this way. If I've got SCOM and it's got an agent on a domain controller, uh, I can't separate the tier zero and tier ones uh, because it's too much of an administrative headache. So, not only are they running it on domain controllers, I'm running it on my SQL servers and my Windows servers, and Linux servers, and so on and so forth. Uh, then effectively, at the end of the day, this is a tier zero and a tier one system. I would at least treat it like a tier zero system, uh, which means uh, you definitely want to secure the means of administrating it. Uh, it certainly should not be done from just random users' desktop or random admins' desktop. You know, We should be doing this behind a paw um, that is firewalled and uh, uh, treated with a lot more... Um, 
uh, uh, treated with a lot more, uh, uh, or just locked down in uh, much more detail. So, uh, if it, for, for separating tiers, but I do highly recommend that if we're thinking about how to use SCOM in your environment, uh, that's what we would go about doing. Now, truth be told, uh, you know, I am focusing this on SCOM because it's a SCOMathon, but this is really true of any management software. I don't care if you're using BMC Remedy or you're using ServiceNow, or uh, that's not really management. Uh, well, different kind of management. Um, but really, you know, uh, McAfee or Semantic uh, or a lot of these tools. Um, you know, we, we got to think about this for anything that actually touches my domain controllers, and touches my servers. Uh, that's a potential inroad point for an attacker. And so we need to start looking at all of our management systems in that way. Um, uh, that includes monitoring. So SCCM and SCOM are probably the big players because every organization, at least that's decent size, is going to either be using those two tools or using something a, co a competitor's project product, all of which really need to be treated with that kind of concept in mind if we uh, if they want to protect their environment. So that brings me really to the end of this presentation. This is the Q and A portion. So um, at this point, I'm going to uh, end the recording. And if we've got any Q and A in the Slack channel uh, and whatnot, uh, we will go. Um, we will cover it. So. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.